katangi tekaka, katangi hoki aho, tihe moriora. Ite wahi itepu aki ai aho, ko te fagani atara, te rohi, ko te ahu mairangi te maunga, ko otari te awa, ko raukawa te moana. Ko te ati awa me nati toranga tira, na mana fenoa ireira. Ko nati pakia te iwi. No ingarangi me itari oku tipuna. Ko Ibbotson me James Nafano. Ko Chris Rawa ko Ruth Mary oku matua. Ko Annabel Rato ko Kate ko Caroline oku teina. Ko James taku hoarangatira. Ko Billy Rawa ko Raphael aku tamariki. Kia ora e te whano. E nō hau ana a mātou i te whanganui a tāra. He kaiakau a hau mō te tare whakaora hene nā rau tangata. Koa Susanna Every Palmer taku ingoa. Tuatahi, nā mihi anō ki nā māna whenua. Tōrua, nā mihi ki nā rau rangatira mā me oku whano e kone e tautoko ana. Nō reira, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā koutou katoa. Thank you very much, Tor, um, Neil and William, and thank you to all of you uh, for being here today. Uh, I am going to start off with this slide. This is me when I was eight. And when I was this age, the idea of doing this, standing up in front of a room full of people and giving a presentation, would have filled me with paralysing horror. Um, I look pretty happy here. It might be my fetching outfit. This is my, uh, my sister Annabelle's sixth birthday party. And I don't actually know if we're dressed in theme or this is just the sort of stuff that we wore in the 1980s. Uh, but I got this photo from my mum and I had asked her for a photo. Um, yes, Greg, you've seen this one before. For a, for a forum that we run for the registrars. And the brief was early leadership promise. Now, the first photo she found had um, this brave little blonde girl leading a pack of timid preschoolers off over one of those gymnastics high beams. And it would have been perfect, except it was a photo of Annabelle and not me. And in fact, all the um, photos in the album that fulfilled the brief of Leadership Promise were my sisters. So I showed the registrars this one because at least I was the tallest. <laughs> so at the time this photo was taken, I was in standard three um, and I was the youngest in my class, not by dint of any precociousness, just my birth date. And I was that kid who had alfalfa and cottage cheese sandwiches. Um, the curse of being the oldest child of a mother who was a dietitian. Um, I was not the bossy one. I did not want to be a class captain. I did not want to be in charge. Um, my siblings' school reports might have said leadership promise, but mine said quiet in class. But I did have two particular childhood qualities that have proved helpful. So first, I wasn't mean. Um, and second, I had lots of questions and ideas. Some good, uh, some not so much, so digging up the neighbour's vegetable garden to install a surprise fish pond was not met with the joy and gratitude that I had anticipated. However, both these traits have stood me in good stead as an academic. Um, so now we see uh, my parents back in the day when my mum had Farrah Fawcett here and my dad had here. Um, and <laughs> They met at the University of Otago Ski Club when my dad was a second year university student and my mum just 16, still in school. 16, you guys! <laughs> um, so I have been to other people's IPLs where people have talked about achieving against the odds. For example, being the first person in their family to go to university. Um, this was not the case for me. The odds were firmly in my favour. So I had these two incredible parents that were completely committed to supporting my parents and I. Um, we lived in a big, albeit somewhat drafty, family home in Wilton. We had our own bedrooms. Um, we had grandparents who helped um, support us and pay for school fees and we were always very loved and encouraged. 
Um, of course, as kids, we took this totally for granted because, you know, we were kids, um, but we certainly don't now, so thank you. Um, a few decades earlier, uh, my gender might have been a barrier um, to becoming a doctor and an academic, but my childhood came at a time of mo marked social change in New Zealand, and because this is our recent history, I think we sometimes just don't reflect on it. But when I was born, there was a certain way that professional success looked. So this Muldoon government was a sea of white, middle-aged, blokey type alphas. There were only two women in government and none in cabinet, and there was very little ethnic diversity. And all this changed during the course of my education. So by the time I finished university, we had a female prime minister, um, a chief, a chief justice, a governor general, an openly transgender MP in the form of um, Georgina Bayer, and a parliament that looked much, much more like the community it served. Um, so it was a pretty lucky time to have been born. I'm pretty sure I would not have become a psychiatrist uh, or a professor of mental health if I had have been born a generation earlier. So. In terms of the structure of this presentation, in a minute, I'm going to introduce three generations of women in my family, Catherine, Dawn and Murza, all wahini toa who had strong interests in science, but did not have the same opportunities that I did. Then after some reflections on my own journey, I'm going to return to what these women would have heard about different constructs of mental health and mental illness over their lives. I'm going to talk about how thinking around mental health has changed over these last 150 years, guided by research, both good and bad. About 10 years ago, as part of my master's, I completed a paper on the history and philosophy of health research. And this influenced my thinking a lot about how my profession has been shaped by historical and philosophical bias. And I'm going to discuss some thoughts about this. I'm going to explain that we cannot pinpoint the precise causes of mental illness and show over time how this has enabled the politics of the day to exert undue influence over ideas around mental health. And I'm going to describe something that I call the enlightenment fa fallacy. So the enlightenment fallacy is a term that I've made up to describe our contemporary derision of the science of the past, but relative obliviousness to our own failings. Then I'm going to talk briefly about some of my own research endeavours and finishing up on, by, on touching on some big unanswered questions in mental health for the future. So I would like to introduce you first to my paternal great-grandmother Catherine Ward, born in 1889 in Victorian England. She was known to me as Gran. Family legend had it that she dearly wanted to study medicine, but this was an avenue simply not open to her at the time. She had a razor sharp intellect, but instead of a career, she was fated to be a single mother of nine children by the time she was about 30. She emigrated to New Zealand in search of a second chance and found a long and happy life here. I'm the baby in this photo, and because she lived to almost 100, Getting to know her was a great privilege of my childhood. Next, another wahini toa. Uh, my maternal grandmother, Dawn Ibbotson, um, known to some people in this room, uh, born 1913, a determined young woman of, from Gore. She was also a lover of science. In fact, she took herself off to the neighbouring boys' school uh, to study physics and chemistry classes instead of doing the needlework and deportment uh, that was on offer at Timaru Girls High. She studied science at Otago in the 1930s. Um, there she is, uh, bottom left front row of the 1936 graduating year with all the other Otago students that year, all 122 of them. Uh, she got a job teaching science, uh, but received anonymous hate mail berating her for taking a job away from a man. She then left the workforce to become a wife and mother, but worked tirelessly until she was over 100, although never again claiming a salary. If you want to know her surprising tip to the black caps, you can ask me that afterwards. 
Um, a couple of decades later, my mother-in-law, Mirza Robbins, was born in 1930 in Latvia. She was admitted into Otago Medical School against all the odds. That she was only one of six women in her class was the least of it. Mirza was a refugee. She had narrowly avoided the Siberian gulags by fleeing the Soviet invasion of her homeland in 1944 with the bombs falling behind them. She spent six years of her adolescence, poor and often hungry, in a refugee camp. Her father did not survive this, and she herself almost died of tuberculosis. She was shipped to New Zealand aged 21. Barely speaking English, she got a job cleaning in Pahiatua Hospital and decided that becoming a doctor looked like a better gig than emptying bedpans, so she taught herself English and got into medical school. Murza had learnt a few things about tenacity and was undeterred by the blatant sexism of the day and the medical fraternity. In fact, she said this wasn't a problem at all, but that might only be because her frame of reference as to what constituted a problem was so different to what many of us have experienced. Uh, Murza is in her 90s and um, she and her husband David couldn't travel from Nelson today, but they are watching online. Uh, Murza, please forgive my poor Latvian, but tu esse super veronis. We will come back to Catherine, Dawn and Murza soon. Getting into medical school did not involve breaking any gender barriers when I went to university in the 1990s because women made up half my class. Uh, throughout my undergraduate years, I was drawn to mental health due to its holistic approach, but I was not so keen to be a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists were called shrinks. Who knows what that means, but it doesn't seem affectionate. And those that I first met seemed a little bit unusual. My first clinical placement at Waitakere Hospital, I assumed the man in the client smoking room, sucking on a rollie and wearing this really tatty former um, yellow bow tie was my first patient to review. Uh, turned out that he was the American locum, which made it a little bit awkward when I tried to do a mental state examination on him. <laughs> and then the year that we graduated, the head of psychiatry at Dunedin Hospital, Dr. Colin Bauer, was in the news for surreptitiously having uh, poisoned his wife with insulin. So maybe unsurprisingly, psychiatry was not seen as a top career choice by myself or my contemporaries. Um, the person who changed my perspective on this was Dr. Joanna MacDonald uh, here on the left. Um, I transferred to Wellington for my final year from Auckland and Joanna was the convener for the TI program in psychiatry. I was super impressed by Joanna. She not only taught us about mental health, she also taught us about leadership, ethics and professionalism in a way I found both inspiring and memorable. And she had really great shoes. <laughs> Um, we were young doctors, remember this, Greg? We were sick of um, two-minute noodles for dinner and we had student loans and we were super excited about the idea of being wined and dined by pharma reps while learning about new drugs. Um, Joanna totally ruined this for us by teaching us about conflicts of interest and bias. Uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch, she said. I remember more about what Joanna taught us and the way that she taught us than any other lecturer, um, which shows the impact that a really great teacher can have on a person. So thank you, Joanna, for years of mentorship, uh, friendship, and for encouraging me into two careers, uh, psychiatry and academia. I would not be here if it was not for you. Now, the middle picture is a segue picture into talking about Pete Ellis, third row in the middle, um, who was head of psychological medicine for 20 years. And I think this was maybe taken when a young Joanna visited the UK with her husband Alec, and um, there is Pete as the oarsman ensuring their smooth passage along the Cherwell River in Oxford. Uh, 
This, of course, is a clumsy metaphor for how Pete steadied uh, the ship in our department for so long, but also his rock-solid guidance and support of me personally. Pete, I don't know if you remember the first research paper that I wrote when I was a trainee. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd basically never even read a research paper before. And I took the draft along to pa Pete and I said, what do you think? And Pete looked at it and said, he was so kind, and he said something like, hmm, uh, yes, you have some content here, but maybe I could give you some guidance about structure. You know, so conventionally, an academic paper has an abstract and then an introduction, a method section, a disc maybe some references. And I said, Prof, Prof, let me stop you there. This is so great. I need to take notes. <laughs> um, if you were disconcerted that I found this advice profound, Pete, you did not let it show. And I thank you for that. Um, my husband, James, is a lawyer and a clever, clear thinker, and he was also wonderful at convincing me that neither magical realism or words like peripatetic um, had any role in research papers. Um, and my brilliant sister, Annabelle, who proofread every word of my PhD and schooled me on grammar. Um, so thank you very much to the three of you for helping turn my... Um, creative style into some semblance of order. Most of my career has been spent in a clinical setting. So as um, mentioned before, I am a forensic psychiatrist, which means I work at the interface of the criminal justice and mental health system. Um, and I'm based out here at Korowai Fariki in the Forensic and Rehabilitation Service. Now, most of the people we work with here have psychotic illnesses, um, commonly schizophrenia, so that has become a strong uh, both clinical and research interest of mine. Clinical work is really rewarding, but man is it tough. So I would like to take a minute to acknowledge the people who choose um, or more likely are cajoled or coerced into taking in leadership roles in the health system. So I think there is an assumption, and maybe this is imported from the private sector, that these roles are richly rewarded in terms of salary and status. Uh, this is bollocks. Um, if you're lucky, there may be a small leadership stipend, but actually the hourly rate plummets as hours and responsibility increase. So I've had the privilege of working with a heap of wonderful leaders in health, um, a non-exhaustive selection of here um, are here on this slide. So they are all wise, uh, compassionate, person-centered, and they go above and beyond. So I could say a lot about each and every one of them, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to say that while the health system is a bit of a mess, it is extremely rewarding to have people like this turning up day after day. So here is a shout out to them and everyone else who is working in the health sector. Don't move to Australia, we need you here. Okay, so my clinical work has guided my academic research interests. Um, when I was a trainee, I was devastated when one of my patients died from bowel obstruction caused by a drug that I had prescribed. The drug was called clozapine and it is the best treatment available for treatment resistant schizophrenia. It has a number of known side effects, but at the time, I had not read anything about its effects on the GI system. So trying to figure out the answers about these GI side effects was in fact my path into an academic career. That was the topic of that first paper that I took to Pete, the one without an abstract. And we did get it published, didn't we? <laughs> Once, yes, a bit of um, tweaking. So the clinical question of clozapine side effects is a niche uh, but important area in which I am genuinely now a world expert. So if I'm invited to speak at an international conference, this is the topic that I'll be asked to talk about. But this topic does not necessarily have broad appeal. 
In fact, my friend Eric said, I'm going to come to your IPL, but it's, if it's about constipation and clozapine, tell me and I'll go for a run instead. <laughs> the irony, Eric, of going for a run instead of listening to a constipation talk. Um, but anyway, stay seated. Uh, this talk is not going to be about bowel obstruction. What I'm going to talk about more is why I do the research that I do and explain that although these research projects might seem diverse, an underlying theme has been to question existing knowledge and practice. It might seem a simple and obvious thing, but it wasn't until my patient died of bowel obstruction that I realised that following current best practices didn't mean that I was treating people in the best possible way. So think of it this way, if we step out of this room and 50 years have passed, and it's 2073, and you ask a psychiatrist for the best treatment recommendations for anxiety or depression or psychosis, are they going to recommend the same things that they would today? Well, I damn well hope not. We are limited now by what we don't know and what we think we know but are wrong about. There is this concept I talked about called enlightenment fallacy, by which I mean the way we believe that we are now practicing scientifically validated medicine as opposed to that quackery that those leech-waving philistines in the past called medicine. We're enlightened, they weren't. But I am quite certain that future generations are going to shake their heads at much of what we do now. The way I see it, medical science is first a mission to understand the underlying causes, the etiology, and the abnormal physiological processes, the pathogenesis of particular ailments. Once you've nailed this, precise diagnoses can be made, targeted therapies developed, or ideally the condition can be prevented altogether. This is illustrated by the scientific approach to COVID-19. The virus was identified, the genome sequenced, um, the vaccinations and treatments developed. Yay, medical science. So what about etiology and pathogenesis in psychiatry? What causes mental illness? This was the title of a book chapter Pete and I wrote for a textbook called Foundations of Clinical Psychiatry. We wrote a whole chapter explaining the complex interplay between genetics and environment that might predispose people to mental illnesses like psychosis. This is called the biopsychosocial cultural model. But the bottom line is, we don't really know. We cannot pinpoint the precise causes of mental illnesses. And when someone asks me the perfectly reasonable question, why do, I have why do I have schizophrenia and how can we fix it? I struggle to give them an answer that they find satisfactory. So how do we proceed to treat something when its causes are still unknown? This is a question that has confounded the field of psychiatry for almost 150 years. I'm now going to take you through a selective and fairly checkered history of thinking about mental health, focusing on these last 150 years interwoven with the lives of those three women in my family that I introduced you to earlier. This recent history of mental health research has been a process of trial and error, crowded with charismatic blokes with beards and big theories. Big theories are appealing. They give an answer. Eureka, we now know what causes mental illness but you will see that they have often been narrow, reductionist and wrong. And one thing that rapidly becomes apparent is when pathogenesis is not properly understood, the socio-political environment can exert an undue influence and this has led to much harm having been done. And we're not out of the woods yet. So my story starts here in the late 19th century when my great-grandmother, Catherine, was born in Victorian London. At this time, the hospital mortuaries were filled with medics uh, dissecting brains in attempts to identify the origins of mental disorders and other suspected mind conditions. These searches ultimately proved fruitless, resulting in a split in the field around the turn of the century. There was the mind camp, 
um, or those interested in the psyche populated by people who were seeking non-biological causes such as adverse childhood experiences um, as root causes of mental disorder. And then there was the body camp who favoured biological causes such as locating a schizophrenia gene. As a spoiler alert, they were both right, kind of, with available evidence suggesting that there is this complex interplay of genetics and um, of biology and environment. In the late Victorian times, society came to view mental illness as a probably genetic moral failing. This was around the time that the term nervous breakdown was coined. The oppressive socio-political climate saw many people with mental illness, intellectual disabilities and behaviour judged to be aberrant, removed from mainstream society and subjected to brutish treatments in vast warehouse-like asylums, as depicted in this slide um, by de, um, La Casa de los Locos, uh, which is the madhouse by Francisco Goya. This was the environment Catherine grew up in. She fell in love with my great-grandfather, an artist called Edwin Ward, when she was still a teenager, and they went on to have nine children together. But this love story has a fly. Edwin was already married to someone else, albeit separated. And until legislative changes took place in 1923, divorce was almost impossible to obtain unless you were very wealthy, which they weren't. And so the relationship and children went unacknowledged by church, um, society, and her family cut her off. Edwin died suddenly when Gran was in her th early 30s, and as a single, never married mother of nine, she too risked being labelled mentally defective or degenerate under the Mental Deficiency Act 1913. It is perhaps unsurprising she chose to take her large family and emigrate to New Zealand, where she assumed the surname Ward and the respectful mantle of fake widowhood. If the opportunities of the time had been different, or she had been a man, um, she might have been starting medical school around the turn of the century, a time of thinking about mental health that was marked by the appearance of one Professor Sigmund Freud, based at the University of Vienna. Freud was a quintessential beard with a big theory and a cigar. He was firmly in the mind camp. He was not the first, but he was certainly the most influential person to promote the uh, revolutionary idea that actually talking to someone with mental distress might help them recover. He also believed that traumatic memories were often consigned to the subconscious, which he saw as an iceberg of hidden depths. Freud had quite a few odd ideas and was a bit weirdly obsessed with sex. One of his big theories was that nearly all neuroses arose from repressed sexual fantasies acquired in childhood. Overall, though, we should have a strong appreciation of Freud and his paradigm-changing approach to mental illness. So then, around the time that Gran immigrated to New Zealand on the other side of my family, my maternal grandmother Dawn was starting her science degree at Otago University. It was the 1930s. As well as the Great Depression, this was a dark time of ineffective biological treatments for mental illness. This included the notorious lobotomy. The lobotomy was pioneered by Igas Moniz in the 1930s, a professor of neurology in Lisbon. His big theory was that mental illness was caused by abnormal connections in the frontal cortex, just in there, and that they just needed to be severed with something really sharp. For this staggeringly incorrect big theory, he later won a Nobel Prize. The intervention was popularised by one of his followers, Walter Freeman of George Washington University. And Dr Freeman, let's be clear, a physician with no surgical expertise whatsoever, devised a procedure that involved inserting an ice pick-like tool through the eye sockets into the prefrontal cortex and wiggling it around. Freeman traversed America disseminating this technique in state mental hospitals. He published articles in prestigious uh, scientific journals explaining that patients were considerably calmed by the surgery. 
Some unfortunate recipients receive the operation as a treatment for being homosexual, which I guess could have been termed successful only in that it left many patients unable to toilet um, or care for themselves with no capacity to form any sort of intimate relationship, let alone a same-sex one. Over 1 in 10 people died from this procedure and the youngest patient was apparently only 4 years old. Around the world it is estimated that 50,000 people were subjected to lobotomies including some in New Zealand. In fact in Dunedin my grandfather, um, Tony James, a gruff neurosurgeon we later knew as Toto, refused to perform a lobotomy on a young woman called Janet Frame who had been referred to him in Seacliff Hospital. Uh, the lobotomy is a shocking example of a big theory backed by bad science leading to immeasurable harm. Other popular but unsatisfactory biological treatments of Dawn's era included sleep therapy, gas therapy, unmodified electroconvulsive therapy and prefrontal leucotomy, the removal of part of the brain to do with processing emotions. Here is part of a letter that Albert Einstein wrote to his first wife about their son Edward who was in long-term care with schizophrenia and for whom some of these treatments had been proposed. Hands off, said Einstein. When all is said and done, I find it better to leave nature alone. Sadly, Einstein, who was apparently quite clever, was right about this as well as relativity. These treatments were an archetypal case of the cures being worse than the disease. Now, back in Europe, and it's 1944, and Mirza has escaped Latvia, which has fallen to the Soviets. She spent the next six years living in a refugee camp in Germany in very impoverished conditions, in a hut that looked a bit like this, but apparently smaller. This was a time when the lack of robust theory about the pathogenesis of mental illness was being exploited for political gain. So behind the Iron Curtain, Reconstructed concepts of mental illness were used to remove and silence political opponents. A new term, sluggish schizophrenia, was coined to describe the mental disorder characterised by opposition to Stalin. In German-occupied countries during the Nazi era, the claim that people with illnesses like schizophrenia were inherently defective led to barbaric acts of forced sterilisation and genocide. And it was not just the Nazi or Soviet states in which social constructs of mental illness were shaped by the politics of the day. Following World War II, fears about the arms race and the Red Scare of communism had strong influences in the West as well. So mothers like Catherine and Dawn unfortunately bore the brunt of this next big theory. Edward Strecker, a leading American psychiatric academic of the time, was convinced that by creating an epidemic of psychoneurosis, mothers were the gravest menace in the fight against communism. There was, of course, a full catalogue of inadequate mothering that led to psychopathology. So you had your overly permissive mothers, juvenile delinquents, overly affectionate women, homosexuality, less affectionate women, refrigerators mothers blamed for autism, and the schizophrenogenic mother, well, you wouldn't want to be one of those, she was a mother midway between being neglectful and overprotective, and she caused schizophrenia. <laughs> it is maybe not surprising that concerns about these social constructs and the harms of the lobotomy and other biological treatments and the abuses of psychiatry in totalitarian states led justifiably, I think, to the rise of an anti-psychiatry movement in the 1960s. These challenges to legitimacy forced the question, what did and did not constitute mental illness? For example, up until the 1970s, homosexuality was considered a psychiatric disorder. In 1972, the an annual American Psychiatry Meeting featured a panel debating whether this should change. One panelist, Dr. John Fryer, renamed himself Henry Anonymous and used a disguise and voice distorting microphone to deliver his presentation. He shocked the room when he began 
I am a homosexual. I am a psychiatrist. His disguise was no joke, as Fryer was in real danger of losing his job if he was identified. He had already lost a university job for being suspected of being gay. It was not until 1973 that homosexuality was removed as a mental illness from the DSM. And now we come to the drugs. When Murza started medical school in 1956, she learned that chlorpromazine, uh, that was marketed as Thorazine, had just been approved as the first pharmacological treatment for psychosis. This was the start of the era of psychopharmacology. Chlorpromazine was enthusiastically promoted by the pharmaceutical industry in an overly simplified way as a, bio, as a, a biological solution to a chemical problem. The advent of antipsychotic drugs, which did reduce psychotic symptoms, and the recognition that costs could be reduced through community rather than inpatient care, contributed to the rapid deinstitutionalisation that took place in the second half of the 20th century. The large asylums were progressively shut down. This was a good thing. However, the increase in community-based resources did not keep pace with the closure of the psychiatric hospitals. And this has contributed to the problems of poor access to support for people experiencing serious mental illness that persists today. Back to the 1960s, and drugs for depression followed antipsychotics. One of the first antidepressants was amitriptyline, introduced in 1961, which boosted available levels of the neurotransmitter noradrenaline. The focus then shifted from noradrenaline to serotonin, and in 1988, fluoxetine appeared. You all know this one, it's Prozac, and that was followed by other selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs. Now, by the time I went to med school in the 1990s, it was the era of these blockbuster drugs. SSRIs for depression and the second generation antipsychotics for psychosis, drugs like olanzapine and risperidone. They were marketed in really comforting ways. Just as a cake recipe requires you to use flour, sugar and baking powder in the right amounts, your brain needs a fine chemical balance, said one industry website. Both SSRIs and second generation antipsychotics were on patent and they were much, much more expensive than their predecessors. And yet there was compelling evidence to support them being vastly superior or so it seemed. I explored the evidence behind the rise of the new drugs in one of the papers I'm proudest of. We showed how randomised controlled trials of the time supporting the superiority of SSRIs and second generation antipsychotics had been biased by vested interests such that the benefits were exaggerated and the limitations minimised. And much of this evidence had been produced by the pharmaceutical industry. Politicians cannot tally their votes, and in sport we rely on umpires, not players, to call the penalties, we wrote. What are we thinking relying on industry to provide evidence about health interventions that they have developed, believe in, and stand to profit from? The truth is that while these drugs have their place, they are not miracle solutions. Despite the tremendous commercial success of the SSRIs, the chemical imbalance theory was bogus. There's no conclusive evidence substantiating chemical imbalances as a root cause of mental illness. We still don't know the precise causes of illnesses like schizophrenia, and we're not yet great at treating them. Antipsychotic and antidepressants are variably effective and they often have side effects. So looking at this checkered history from the time Catherine was born to me standing here today, you can see the practice of psychiatry as a series of pendulum swings between mind and body, getting things right and getting things wrong. Lauded big theories are celebrated and then they disappoint. And research has been influenced by the vested commercial interests of the pharmaceutical um, companies and over time, some real harm has been done to people and their families. There is hindsight bias in this, of course. 
While there were some bad actors, a lot of dumb stuff was done by well-meaning people, as is usually the way. People trying to do their best with the knowledge and resources they had at the time. People like us. And I don't expect that history will be that gentle in us. Because the treatment people might be offered now for schizophrenia or PTSD or anxiety will be different in 50 years. And the job of the researchers is to help improve knowledge and to weed out the dumb stuff that comprises current clinical practice that we just don't know yet. The questions that contemporary researchers are asking are as much about society as they are about individuals and illness. Overall, these reflections have shaped my own research. So some interesting questions from research that I've been involved in have asked, why is New Zealand one of the only countries in the world to allow direct-to-consumer advertising of prescription medications, including antipsychotic medications, when this contributes to over-prescribing? Well, the answer is that this was a naive oversight in our legislation from back when we didn't know better, but we do now and we should stop doing this. Back in 2010, why was organic herbal incense making people psychotic when they smoked it? We got it tested by ESR and it turned out it was laced with potent synthetic cannabinoids. Are people in prison able to access the mental health treatment they need? No, they are not. And this is a violation of their human rights and something we as a country should be ashamed of. In fact, currently across New Zealand, many people are not able to access specialist mental health services due to staff shortages and resourcing limitations, and especially amongst child and adolescent services. And this is also something that we urgently need to change it, to turn our minds to. And then in the forensic space, how are changes in society affecting the way disgruntled people interact with public figures? Is the stalking and harassment of politicians, for example, becoming more common with the rise of social media and post-COVID? The answer is yes. The frequency and intensity of threats towards people like our former PM, Jacinda Ardern, has increased, and there appears to be contagion from trolling on social media to people becoming emboldened to threaten public figures in person. How did COVID-19 affect our mental health and well-being in New Zealand? Well, for most of us, we did fine. But for many people with pre-existing mental distress, both the lockdown and its consequences had significant and persisting effects on well-being, with increased anxiety, depression and substance use. Adolescents and young adults have also been disproportionately affected. Back in the forensic space again, and how do we treat PTSD in significantly traumatised people in prison or in forensic inpatient care? Medications don't work that well for PTSD, and forensic populations have been excluded from previous trials of psychological therapies, making it hard to know what treatment might be best. Well, to test this out, we did our own trial, running a randomised trial on psychological treatment called EMDR, um, and we're just about to publish that. We found that this therapy was safe, effective, and made a big difference to participants' lives. Uh, with my wonderful colleague, Tom Fluitt, leading the teaching, my department has this year launched a course uh, teaching EMDR therapy so that hopefully that becomes a more accessible treatment. How does stigma and discrimination against people with severe mental illness contribute to their 20 um, year shortened life expectancy? Well, the answer is in a myriad of different ways, but in part due to multiple points of institutional discrimination within the health system. In today's world, mental health is something we care about in a way, well, something that we can talk about in a way that my great-grandmother and grandmother could not. It is also something that, as a society, we are really focused on. In 2018, New Zealanders made more than 5,200 submissions to the government inquiry into mental health and addictions. 
uh, the resulting report, He Aro Oranga, called for transformational change into mental health and addiction system. We recognise that mental well-being is deeply connected to wider well-being in our society and to improve mental health and addiction outcomes, we must address wider social determinants that influence mental health and social well-being. We know these things, but we're still grappling with the how. There are big questions about mental health that we don't have clear answers for. Why does the quality of life seem to be improving over time, yet more people than ever report experiencing mental distress? What is causing this and when will we have better treatments? What do people need in order to thrive psychologically? New Zealand's suicide rate is amongst the highest in the OECD for young people. How do we change this? What is the best way to combat stigma against mental illness? What can we do to make mental health fairer for Māori? In terms of the last question, well within my own family history, I've described how Catherine and Murza came to Aotearoa, New Zealand to escape persecution and found a safe haven here. This was by no means a universal experience. We must not ignore our country's own dark legacy of colonisation, racism and marginalisation. Mass European immigration, um, the Crown's breaches of Te Tariti and structural racism have had negative consequences for tangata whenua now across more than seven generations. The enduring impacts of colonisation are a cause of persisting health inequities. This is especially evident in mental health, with Māori experiencing significantly higher rates of mental illness, higher rates of suicide, a greater prevalence of substance use problems and experiences of coercive treatment. These problems are not Māori problems to fix, they are colonisation problems. Taika Waititi explained in his Raising Our Voices speech two weeks ago in the United States that when Indigenous people are asked to fix the consequences of colonisation, it's like someone coming into your home, stealing all your stuff, burning the place down and then asking politely if you need a hand to rebuild it. You built the effing house, he says. You built it. You burnt it down. It is indeed the system's responsibility and the work of everyone in it to correct the underlying inequities that persist in mental health services today. It is a challenging but exciting time to be a mental health researcher. Uh, change will come, but how it looks remains to be seen. Don't fall for the enlightenment fallacy. This is not as good as it gets. Um, I've done a lot of research work on clozapine, but I can't wait till this research becomes obsolete because we've replaced clozapine with something better. A lot of what we think we know today, including the topics that I research, might turn out to be rubbish. But I'm proud that I recognise that, and I think if I stop believing that, then it's time to stop doing research. And speaking of time to stop, I want to conclude by thanking my collaborators, uh, my clinical colleagues, and particularly my former Parehurehu team who were so supportive of clinical research, and also all those people who gave their time to participate in research. Having an academic career has given me the chance to collaborate with others both locally and internationally, and that has been both fun and an enormous privilege. Um, all the research that I've talked about today has been done by teams um, and I've collaborated with about 200 other researchers so I can't uh, name them all but I want to recognise them here. And my best team is my department, the Department of Psychological Medicine in Wellington with all these really cool people who are on these slides being a key reason um, why I love my job. Uh, so. Last of all, um, to my children, you had no choice but to come, but you've sat here very patiently. Uh, and to all the rest of you, uh, you had a choice, but you still turned up. Uh, Namahi nui kia koutou.